So my name is Catherine Paul and I'm thrilled to welcome you today to this session on Standing on the Shoulders of Giants, the Heritage of Open Education, and to introduce to you Norm Friesen, who is here from Thompson River University. He is a Community Research Chair in E-Learning Practice and currently has a new book out, which is very exciting, called Rethinking E-Learning Research. So I'm thrilled to welcome you and I hope that this is a really exciting and engaging I'm sure it will be. So yeah. Thank you. thank you very much, Catherine. Um, yeah, and thank you for, uh, for your time and attention. Um, so <coughs> Uh, the, the focus of my talk today is going to be on um, some of the what, you, what could be called the history of uh, of open education, uh, because I think one of the things that's important in understanding uh, what's going to happen in the future, and I know there's been many discussions about um, you know the the future of open education, where it's headed, what its relationship to the institute to, to educational institutions is, um, and uh, uh, and uh, what, what that future might look like. I think it's really important to look at uh, what's happened in the past and the fact that open education um, as, as, as a movement and as a way of, uh, as, as a political and a, a practical kind of stance uh, has, has a rich and varied history and, uh, and has some really substantial contributors in the past that, um, uh, that that in some ways can can give us strength and can uh, give us context for the work that we're that, that we're doing and engaged in. Uh, <clears throat> so I'm going to talk about uh, first of all what open education is. I know that you all have know about that, but I think that it's important to to look at the definition so that it it's it's broad enough and uh, and and the and the different factors and the different sort of contributing factors can be understood in their interrelationships so that they can be identified in the past. Um, and I'll talk about what some of the <coughs> some of the precursors or the heritage of of open education are in the past. I'll give three examples: uh, Antonio Gramsci, Walter Benjamin, and Paulo Freire. And then I'll talk a little bit about what some of the lessons are from this. Um, and uh, hope to you know have a lively dis or discussion with you guys about what um, um, what what some of these things mean and, and what some of the possibilities are. I wanted to just start off though by mentioning this book from Michael Peters and Rodrigo Brites. It's called Open Education and Education for Openness. Um, it's a result of a of a um, a, a, a graduate seminar that Michael Peters had in uh, um, in Indiana and in Illinois a, a, a year or two ago, and uh, there's some really interesting context here about open education. One of the precursors uh, <clears throat> that Michael Peters uh, emphasizes is is uh, Karl Popper, who wrote um, um, about uh, open society, and uh, he you know he basically had the, the sort of black swan idea, right? That if if you can have a hypothesis, uh, and it can be accepted as true only insofar as it, there is no falsifying evidence, right? Until you encounter the black swan that shows that not all swans are white. Well, the, the premise there, of course, is that information is openly shared, and that if something is discovered uh, that that's an exception, um, then that also be, uh, is is open to verification and is is openly uh, acknowledged and discussed. So it relies on the open circulation of information. So I, in, in this discussion, I identify uh, three characteristics of open education. First of all, uh, there, are, there are three components. First of all, teaching and learning are educational processes understood in a really broad sense um, to include uh, you know, teachers interacting with students, uh, uh, students interacting in groups with each other, uh, uh, people engage in, in, um, interacting with technology, um, and uh, uh, so whether it's sort of in more traditional contexts or uh, non-traditional contexts. A second important component, of course, is technology understood principally as infrastructure. Uh, uh, so uh, seeing technology as, uh, as a way of <coughs> providing openness and uh, uh, allowing for the free and uh, unrestricted circulation of information uh, within a community and between communities. And of course, the third component is one that's um, eminently political and cultural, and it is the open and free access uh, to all of these processes. So uh, that's where questions about, um, of course, copyright come in, um, but it also uh, is, is where questions about you know which type of technology infrastructures and which characteristics of the infra of, of the internet as an infrastructure are significant, and. Uh, 
and these three are interrelated in complicated ways, right? They're, like no one is no one is really has a separate logic from the other. They're, they the, they interact and they're interdependent um, in ways that that uh, are can be difficult to disentangle. And um, and again, as I said at the outset, one one thing that's really important is is uh, for for this presentation is that the history of the interrelationship between these three things goes back much farther than the internet and uh, open source software. Um, of course, they, it goes. I mean, it goes. At least as far back as the Enlightenment, um, and a lot of and, and Michael Peters and uh, Bertez also emphasized the, the the significance of uh, of the of Enlightenment ideals in understanding open education and uh, and and so in 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 the case of of uh, the Enlightenment, of course, the technology and technological infrastructure is printing press and the circulation of printed materials and. Uh, and uh, teaching and learning processes would have been um, confined to kind of you know upper upper classes uh, very often in that context. So um, this is sort of how I how I en envision the three things as interrelated, uh, uh, and um, you can see that there's a point here where the three. Um, interconnect, and so what I've kind of done in this in this talk, and the way that I've identified uh, precursors to open education, is by looking at where these three things intersect. So who, you know, what what uh, what figures in the past, and what um, activists and uh, uh, contributors have uh, been working in the space where uh, questions about. Um, um, uh, the politics of information and of knowledge is important, um, and uh, openness in that connection, where they've talked about and, and been engaged with technology and infrastructure, uh, whatever was available or, or important at the time, and also where they're concerned about uh, uh, teaching and learning and educational processes as, um, as something that's political and as something that happens through uh, technology. So, uh, and there's there's a, there's a large number of precursors that can be identified. Of course, the question is, you know, how um, just to sort of winnow it down to a few uh, illustrative examples, I guess, in this case. <coughs> Um, so a precursor can be a movement or a person. It can be uh, th these things. It needs to combine the three elements, like I've said, uh, generally in reaction against commercialization and for the for, for the purposes of empowering um, um, learners and people generally. And uh, and also I want to emphasize that that one thing that's important too is that you know when when people in education and in, in, in many other fields uh, talk about um, you know. Uh, their uh, or, or under, the way that they articulate their teaching activities to themselves and their teaching values is very often in terms that are germane to <coughs> to to these to these precursors. Especially, I would say uh, the first one that I'll talk about, which is Gramsci. And I think that it's it's useful to remember that uh, that that they. The, that faculty members uh, very often, especially in in, in um, fields that have to do with social service, uh, um, you know, are affirm these values and that and that it's that they share them in common with open education, whether uh, they know it or not. And and I think that there's a real um, important kind of leverage point, um, at least among some faculty members in that regard. So whether they're familiar with. Um, <coughs> You know, technology or not, or, or creative co um, issues about copyright or not, um, they're they're very much they would be very much sympathetic to attempts to kind of open up education and uh, and and engage with education in these ways. So I said Gramsci is really important in this way in this regard, and and one of the things that he did is he. Um, he actually didn't emphasize technology too terribly much, but but his the way he understood knowledge and education is is so significant, um, and and in some ways uh, really provides a, a, a political and a practical basis for understanding um, education as a, a politically engaged activity uh, that can involve everybody and that, that needs to be open to everybody. So some of the key words that he used are ideology. Um, he in some ways is key for introducing the term and defining the term hegemony um, in a way that's 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 really important in, in uh, social and political theory and he talked about something called organic intellectuals um, <clears throat> so he he talked about ideology and hegemony as something that is spontaneous and, cu and cultural he said that culture is an exercise of thought um, the acquisition of general ideas and the habit of connecting causes and effects and one of the things that he was saying is that 
everybody's participating in culture, everybody's engaged in some ways in the, this exercise of thought, this habit of connecting cause and effects and figuring things out. And so, so the question is to engage in that process and to, uh, and to acknowledge that that's, that that's what people are doing every day all the time. He described hegemony and ideology, and this, this definition can be understood as referring to both as uh, shared ideas or beliefs which serve to justify the interests of dominant groups. Um, and, uh, and he said that, or he emphasized that in some ways there's a natural tendency to, um, <clears throat> to affirm and to share and, and to reiterate uh, the dominant ideas and beliefs. He referred to this, the idea of spontaneous consent um, as being just something that, that, uh, that just generally tends to happen. And one of the reasons is, is because the, um, exercise of thought and the habit of connecting cause and effects um, very often is just simply a question of habit and it's something that that we you know um, uh, receive from the world around us and we accept simply as true because it uh, is is repeated so often and it's just part of uh, what is accepted as common sense and not challenged as such so I mean uh, one example that I provide here is is the is this cover from the economist right where uh, which came out in the, the fall uh, and uh, and of course the way that it frames the whole <coughs> economic crisis is in terms of saving the system um, and it doesn't it doesn't open the question of well what are the issues about the system that we should talk about <clears throat> what constitutes the system what is this what is this enormous crisis of the system um, that is supposed to be so powerful and and being generating wealth for all of us what is uh, what is should we put the system into deeper question right and and by closing off those questions through it through by framing the whole the whole issue uh, in this way um, it's you know it, it it's a good illustration of, of what Gramsci said, uh, means by ideology and hegemony so he emphasized that knowledge and culture are central <clears throat> and uh, in in society because it's it's knowledge and uh, and and common sense um, which is part of our culture that uh, is is a question is um, is what constitutes ideology and what constitutes politics. So he uh, <clears throat> he said that as a result, education is really one of the key leverage points that we have for changing society. And I mentioned the term organic intellectuals as being a really important question uh, or important uh, idea for Gramsci. And uh, so he said that everybody in some ways is an intellectual, not just by function or by job description, but rather he said like everybody at time fries a couple of eggs or uh, so up a tear in a jacket and we do not necessarily say that everybody is a cook or a tailor but everybody is participating in these these activities just by being members of society and uh, since everybody is engaged and in whether this in this consent which is spontaneous but also happens by culture by participating in the culture that is where we can as educators uh, uh, see our, our task because we're able to engage with people about their thought processes and about uh, the world around them and the contradictions that we see in the world around us whether it's uh, something like the, the the question about banking or, or uh, whether it's um, um, something much more uh, specific <clears throat> So everybody, ha everyone has the potential for intellectual and political engagement, and this is what Gramsci said. Everybody carries on some form of intellectual activity, participates in a particular conception of the world, and has conscious line of moral conduct, and therefore contributes to sustain a conception of the world or to modify it. That is to bring um, into being new modes of thought. And uh, and again, this is this is what he saw as as being as being one of the uh, or this is where education, the promise of education, is most potent. Um, in in that, in that it's possible to awake consciousness and awareness of these modes of thought um, and, uh, and, and change them as a result. So he saw the learner as uh, active and creative and not a passive and mechanical recipient. And, um, and he saw education as being something that, uh, that whose goal was to uh, take the learner um, or, or the student to a position where he or she is able to think for himself. And this is, this is a central um, enlightenment um, understanding of education, right? Um, which goes back to Kant, who said that enlightenment is about um, um, freeing people from their what he called their self-imposed immaturity right and which and 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 he saw the way that to be freed is to be able to reason for oneself and i think that that is that that's absolutely essential for for uh, any form of education and uh 
and, uh, and it's important uh, for the political uh, context in which open education um, or uh, education for all has been theorized. And so let me, let me f uh, switch to somebody who's focused on um, technology um, and uh, learning and also uh, and also openness. And uh, that's uh, this person here. Let me just read the quote though before I give you the context. Um, and today, there is hardly a person who could not, in principle, find an opportunity to publish somewhere or other comments on his work, grievances, documentary reports, that sort of thing. As a result, the distinction between author and public is about to lose its basic character. The difference becomes um, merely functional. It may vary from case to case. An author may turn into a, 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 a pub member of the reading public and vice versa at any time. Um, at any moment, the reader is ready to turn into a writer. And the interesting thing about the person who wrote this quote is that uh, he lived only until 1940. And so he, he anticipated a kind of uh, world that, uh, that, that we sort of uh, celebrate and accept as uh, commonplace today. He, uh, his key work um, was the, uh, one of his key works was the work of art in the age of mechanical reproducibility. And two key words from that, uh, that text are aura and distraction. And uh, he theorized the relationship between technology and education, or technology and, well, really kind of like perception and knowledge and uh, politics in a really interesting and counterintuitive way. What he said was that, um, Mechanical reproduction of art means that um, what he called the aura withers, and he. Uh, so you know we don't have to go to the art gallery even across the street to see works of art from Emily Carr, right? We can go and look them up on the internet or find postcards or whatever. And he said that that um, that has a fundamental uh, consequence uh, for. Uh, perception and knowledge and the status of art. He said that the technique of reproduction detaches the reproduced object from the domain of tradition. Um, and he saw the domain of tradition as being almost kind of like a you know religious kind of thing. And he said this is not this is not a bad thing, but it's a good thing. For the first time in world history, mechanical reproduction emancipates the work of art from the, its parasitical dependence on ritual. And so, as a result, because it's pulled out of that context, <coughs> that quasi-religious context, it can take on all sorts of other characteristics and have all sorts of other functions and be perceived and known in all sorts of different ways. And he really gave emphasis to uh, the particular technology at his, of, of his age, which was film. And he looked at, um, and at that time anyways, you know, what was important were um, Riefenstahl's uh, Triumph of the Will and uh, something like um, Boonwell's uh, uh, L'Age d'Or. And um, he said that this kind of art is received in a stage in a state of distraction, and he saw this distractive, distracted reception as enabling the convergence of educational value and consumer value in a new kind of learning. To quote an interpretation of, of the work, and uh, he said that uh, that basically a new type of perception emerges from this process. And I think that um, you know the questions about how perception and attention and what's happening, how they're being shaped by technologies is really key. Um, and, and Benjamin um, at this stage was, was already emphasizing this, saying that um, the aesthetic characteristics of new technological media um, present both potential and challenges for learning. So he's interested in the aesthetics of, uh, and, and the way that they shape um, you know, perception and pleasure and uh, stories and other things. And he sees this as being politically relevant and, uh, and emphasize that technology is cultural in its educational significance. And I think that that's a really important uh, point. I think that uh, technology and uh, open educational resources are, are, are really significant, not, um, <coughs> uh, uh, well, one thing that's significant about them is that they're seen as being a way of transmitting and preserving and, and expanding um, a, a kind of a cultural heritage, a shared cultural heritage. And uh, um, that can be, and, and, and uh, I guess a shared kind of cultural heritage and wealth that can be accessed by all, um, rather than necessarily just simply being a new type of tool. Um, because uh, of course, all of the, <coughs> All of the technical and sort of tool-related uh, aspects of open educational resources and even a, of Web 2.0 have all been in place uh, for the last uh, 15 years, right? But it's only been in the last uh, few years that we that that a lot of this sort of 
cultural and political and, and practical value of, of these technological possibilities is being realized in new and interesting ways. And, uh, and I, so I think I, in my, I'm trying to make the case in some ways that this, it's principally a, a discussion about uh, culture and policy and um, it, ways of reinterpreting the technology rather than um, just simply um, understanding the most efficient way of, of, of applying it. Because uh, if it was a question, again, of technological potential, we would have been having this discussion earlier. Um, but rather, there's cultural and other uh, factors that, are, that, that take precedence. So Paulo Freire is the third figure that I'm going to look at. Um, and he, uh, one of the key things that's important in terms of his use of technology was the fact that he uh, developed cultural circles for teaching, reading, and writing. He was somebody who was an activist and who uh, <clears throat> actively applied the use of technology for education um, for what he might have referred to as the masses for everybody. And the way that he did this was uh, by his involvement in politics as uh, education minister in Brazil and his involvement in regional politics in Brazil as well. And uh, I don't think I'll be able to go through the key terms, but what, what, he, uh, what he emphasized is that uh, is that the technology, he wasn't uh, for or against the technology, but rather he saw it as being something that could be interpreted and shaped uh, rather than something that shaped and interpreted what education was he, he and, and politics was. He, uh, he, what he did is he, in terms of practical activity, is he uh, bought uh, 35,000 slide projectors and uh, used them to display pictures uh, in, in literacy circles in, uh, in, in uh, rural areas predominantly in Brazil. And he, <coughs> he used uh, visual representations of basic situations that people would have been familiar with, and he would have said that uh, that you know in these basic uh, uh, representations uh, lie um, questions that are that are of interest to everybody who's involved in um, would be involved in in the learning circle, and uh, he said that it's impossible even though he was teaching them how to become literate. Um, this wasn't just a cognitive activity in his mind. He saw it as being combined with lessons in self-reflection, cultural identity, and political agency. And it was actually inherently cultural um, in a really important way because literacy was uh, was a prerequisite for voting uh, at that time in Brazil. And so uh, what he, he was essentially doing is he was um, not just only teaching them how to read and how to gain the power that would be associated through reading, but rather he was also uh, enfranchising, giving them the vote. Um, as well. So these are, these are examples of the kinds of pictures that he would have shown. And uh, so this, this, this type of picture would, would be uh, you know, showing people what they were involved in and depicting what they were involved in so that they could reflect on, on that situation. Um, you can see here another basic situation. He, he really emphasized the relationship between, uh, uh, between humans and between hum humanity and nature as well. And so that's one of the things that's you know, evident in this picture and in this one as well. Um, so both you know, the situation of, of labor, the situation of a person's relationship to the world around them, the natural world around them, and also to others. So this was part of his national literacy um, program. And uh, uh, he spent a lot of money um, in, uh, at that time and more recently when he um, introduced schools into uh, the Sao Paulo uh, uh, um, educational district, I guess. And uh, he established a central laboratory for educational informatics and invested in a lot of uh, in, in televisions and, and uh, other technologies that would have been uh, state of the art at the time. Um, there's a really interesting discussion um, of uh, that happened between Seymour Papert and Paulo Freire, uh, and it's captured in video. And I have um, I, I, one of the things that this talk is based on, or that sort of accompanies this this presentation, is this. Uh, uh, open educational resource on um, Wiki Educator, and uh, I. Um, this is part of a co course that I gave uh, in the in the in the winter, and uh, what we did is we had a, a workshop session with. Uh, with a trainer from Wiki Educator and creating Wiki content, and so. Um, through that process, I created. We, we were all asked to create a, you know, a Wiki Educator resource. So this is the Wiki Educator resource that I created, and uh, 
and uh, there's, a, there's a video clip here and also some text that I grabbed um, about that, that video clip or that, about what's being exchanged between Papert and uh, Paulo Freire. And this discussion is really important because it, uh, it is precisely, or it, it's very much uh, a discussion that's, uh, that's important and that's been um, in some ways uh, built upon and developed further in, in this context, uh, in this conference. And uh, because it's about the end, you know, the end of schooling that, that might be enabled by uh, the use of computer technology and, and uh, new cognitive possibilities that it would open up. And uh, Freire says something really interesting towards the end of the debate. He says, I don't accept the claim um, that Seymour Papert has made that the ending of school is inevitable. For me, the challenge is not to end school, but to change it completely and radically and to help give birth uh, from a body that doesn't correspond anymore to the technological truth of the world to being as actual as the technology itself. It's actually kind of a complicated quote or statement, but one of the things, and I think he's saying a bunch of different things, but one of the things he's saying is that, uh, that the, um, that what he hopes to, that the school will will uh, will uh, will realize or change into is something that is is as real as the technology you know that we have in front of us um, um, every day, but also that doesn't correspond to a truth that might be embodied in that technology that that actually transcends that, and uh, and but but I encourage you to check the debate out because it, it's uh, and and to think about this quote um, in in the context of the larger debate. Um, so, but and I think one of the things that he's saying as well is that uh, when he's saying that education is uh, uh, doesn't correspond anymore to the technological truth of the world, uh, one of the things he's saying is that education is not simply a function. And I think that it's really important to uh, when 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 discussing it, when we're thinking and discussing about the the uh, the relationship between open educational resources and the and the free culture movement and and, and education as an institution is to recognize that education is not um, about, it's not exclusively about the function of learning. Um, and and because, uh, uh, because if it were about the function of learning, it would be a really, it would be radically different, right? There, there's, ways of, there's ways of operationalizing learning and, and understanding learning as being a kind of a developmental function. But, but educational institutions um, <clears throat> are far more central to our society um, than, than um, simply institutions that perform a function that can be reduced to, uh, to economic and technological terms. Um, educational institutions, uh, you know, to put it one way, are, are so important and so politically, uh, 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 how should I say, it? volatile, that uh, because they are the means through which our society reproduces itself, right? They're the, they're the way w in, which, uh, the, in which the things that, that are part of a society and, and are considered important in a society are transmitted from one generation to another. So that process uh, essentially involves everybody in the society, right? So it involves, <clears throat> it involves uh, you know, religious and cultural aspects. It's a it's highly political process uh, because the question is, of course, how do you decide what's important and what should be passed on and what, what's going to be emphasized in, in, uh, in the relationship between one generation generation and another. And uh, so, so, and this is clear from the precursors that I've discussed. They all talk about the politically charged nature of learning and uh, its rich interrelationship with technology. Technology, of course, enables uh, different ways of, of uh, working with information and knowledge and accessing it and, and changes the dynamics through which that occurs. But that is all embedded in an in a, in a institutional and material and political context that, uh, in which there are so many stakeholders and so many important interests that, um, um, that just understanding what the technology enables uh, uh, in, uh, in isolation um, is, uh, can, can be deceptive. So uh, it's important to take this into account when understanding the relationship of open educational and, and educational institutions. And I think I've, uh, one thing I think that, that I've noticed in a number of talks that, that's really interesting is that, is, is also the long-term kind of character of, 
of uh, change and of, of, of the, 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 I guess, the snail's pace at which some of the dynamics between technology, uh, technological possibilities, and uh, institutional realities um, interact. And I think that uh, th these things happen um, and, uh, over, over periods of decades. And it was interesting that the presentation about the Open Educational Resources uh, Project in Holland um, you know, is, is a project that's going to go on for a decade. Um, and uh, yeah, so what I'll do is I will leave it at that and, uh, and open um, the floor for questions. And uh, I'd be happy to um, hear your thoughts and, and reflections. Yeah. Um, well, I, I think if you look at the, the precursors that, that the oh, sorry, what kind of, so the question was, what kind of society does open education want to create? Um, and and I, in some ways, what, I, what I'm doing here is, uh, is I'm trying to, uh, you know, align um, open education with a political and intellectual tradition of a particular kind. And uh, one of the slides that I didn't go through is looking at Thomas Friedman as a precursor. And my view of Thomas Friedman is, is principally critical. I, I don't think, I think that if open education is interested in, in, um, in, uh, <coughs> in positioning itself and, and addressing a question like what kind of society do we want, um, I, I really like, uh, discourage turning to someone like Thomas Friedman, or, um, uh, and and the, the, one of the reasons is that is essentially that he dis, he presents um, uh, technology as uh, as something that that or he, he presents the forces that we need to respond to and the future of of society uh, and 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 um, um, this, well the, the future the sort of f our, our global collective future as being largely out of our out of our control and 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 his solution is that we need to uh, conform to uh, forces that that are are not something that we can address and control, and uh, and that the the, 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 the more the, the more fully we're able to uh, harness and 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 fit in with that with those forces, the better. And and I, I you know I think that that's a, a, a really problematic position, and I think that that the uh, the position that's articulated by the, the intellectual tradition that I've been um, emphasizing would be that. Um, <clears throat> Open that would be that the kind of society that open educational resources and uh, open um, culture movement um, w would envision would be a society that um, that where where education is is there for people to allow people to think for themselves um, and that means critically uh, about the society around them and uh, would also be one in which um, in which policy and uh, uh, um, and politics uh, of of copyright and of uh, of media and all their different forms, right? Would 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 serve that those ends um, rather than and, and would guard against things like concentration of, of of power in in media in whatever form. So I mean that's a really general answer, but I think I think that I think that to be able to answer that kind of question, you need to you need to sort of. Uh, um, understand or align or, or contextualize open education, like whose version of open educational uh, resources um, um, or what interpretation of open educational resources you, you want to uh, uh, you want to take. Uh, yeah. Mm -hmm. from open educational resources and, um, and you're, you're hitting all of the, the notes that I'm incredibly concerned about in terms of who, who, who affects the culture. You know, like the question of education is by Biden for me. And I'm curious if you, if you may have a, a Nazi slide in that. And I, if I think back to um, 1935, 1937, the Nazis would love to be able to Lives yeah. Well, and I think I think that's one thing that's really important. Um, uh, the that is that uh, I mean one thing that's that's really significant is is that 
uh, the like movements like uh, you know what people were doing with open, with uh, learning objects and what's happening with open educational resources is the danger of it being co-opted um, I think that that's a real danger like uh, one of the things that happened to me was that I was working with um, a uh, a, a provincial government, which will remain unnamed, in implementing uh, uh, learning object metadata. I've done a lot, of did a lot of work in that area, and uh, and so they they they've been they've developed a, a really substantial collection of of, op of learning resources that are are allied with curriculum, and uh, and so what that allows you to people to do right would be. <coughs> On the positive side, teachers can go and enhance their lessons with uh, the, those resources and and uh, and and, uh, and create a much more en engaging, um, you know, uh, uh, study or context for, for students. But one of the things that happened is when there was a teacher strike uh, pending in that in that province, what the what the what the provincial government did is they said, okay, if you know concerned parents, if you want to teach your children at home and have them keep up with the lessons, check out these resources, and you can find them. They're all uh, you know organized organized here by um, um, uh, you know topic and age and class and everything else right and it was like okay well I mean it was it was it was a complete you know co-optation of, of uh, or it could be understood in that way of, of what um, a lot of the ideals and, and um, hopes you know that were that were for for those types of resources and and something similar can happen with open educational resources as well insofar as uh, <coughs> Insofar as uh, I mean, in, in all sorts of different ways, right? Um, and uh, and and they can be this type of technology and, and these possibilities can be reinterpreted and uh, and leveraged in ways that that are unforeseen. Other comments? Yeah. Uh, I, I often see the. Um one of the political traditions that I also see as a precursor to open ed, where I, I started from was sort of the free speech um, and marketplace of ideas um, idea, where, mm -hmm. where you have competition between different good ideas. And when um, you're, you're allowed to access all, all the ones, you, you did tend to pick what you like best or what, and the best ideas rise to the surface. Um, what do, you, do you think that's um, a good precursor for um, open ed? Um, I think that I think that the freedom of speech uh, idea is really good. I, 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 um, and, and, or the, I mean, and the, and the, the tradition of, 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 of free free expression that goes back to the Enlightenment and that is dependent on the technology of printing and on the and on widespread literacy. I think those are those are really important values um, and I, they're central. I think um, and and they provide a, a really a strong foundation. I, I, I really wonder about the marketplace of ideas and, and a, a metaphor because I think that one of the problems and, and one of the things that technology allows right is for <clears throat> is for different forms and, and Benjamin really brought this up um, and that's why the, I had the slide from uh, Triumph of the Will because that was a really powerful um, that that's a really powerful way of of uh, presenting ideas or presenting an ideology, um, but it has almost nothing to do with a marketplace, right? I mean, like if you go, and, I mean, if you're going and watching a movie like that, um, um, or uh, you know, you're watching whatever uh, uh, um, broadcast or other forms of of, uh, of information on the web or on TV. I mean, this it's, it's not about it's not about evaluating ideas. It's about um, rhetoric and and uh, uh, a persuasion, right, of different kinds. It's about it's about an, um, appealing to to uh, you know it, it's about working with dynamics that have nothing to do with uh, or very little to do with um, with uh, comparing and contrasting and, and establishing value comparative value. So. Yeah. I, just, I so appreciate your perspective and giving us more context and depth to this discussion. In some ways, I feel Thanks. like the first <laughs> of the conference. But I guess I'm wondering, um, as a historian, giving us this context, looking back and learning from these lessons, where do you see the future of open education going? What do you see as possible pitfalls, things to be aware of as we continue on? Mm -hmm. um, because obviously with all of the conversations about OERs, especially um, Catherine Kennedy's um, keynote and what is happening in Africa, where, where right. is this going? Uh, I, I, I mean, I think, 
I think that, um, again, it, it, it's, it's always a good idea to look at what's, what's happened in the past, and, uh, you know, and uh, I, think that, I think that, you know, one of the things that, that happens, right, is that, <clears throat> is that when, these things, when, when these things develop and when these possibilities explored, are explored, they always leave the field changed. It's never unchanged, and so it's you know we can you know we can be conf confident that will that 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 it's going you know it'll be a contribution that will uh, that will that will um, have an impact. But the, the the question is you know what kind of change right and and it, and generally you know the the type of change that happens with educational institutions and, and again their central and contested role in society I think contributes to this. Uh, is that they they um, establish a set of possibilities and, a, and one of the slides that I had here that I wanted to that I sort of skipped over is that open learning can I think form in a really important stream and, and a really important set of possibilities there's there's another part of the open educational open education uh, and the tradition of open education in in the Scandinavian and German countries in Europe and that's the people's schools and uh, so these were government sponsored uh, schools uh, that were essentially just open and the idea was to open Open education to everybody, and uh, based on Enlightenment ideals about uh, about um, <clears throat> about uh, letting people to decide things for themselves, and letting uh, having people empowered by knowledge. But um, um, but I think that. Uh, uh, I think that, uh, that that I really hope that we're carving out a possibility and and and, and a way of uh, establishing not just people's schools but but something like that um, and uh, and I think that would be a really valuable contribution and I think that if if that th that would also be um, uh, uh, something that could that could shape and change uh, the institution of inst institutions of higher education in different and interesting ways. Uh, another another interesting example is provided by. Um, the uh, type of open university that um, Jacques Derrida and Jacques Lacan were involved in in, in uh, Paris. They essentially established kind of an alternative university, um, and uh, of course their impact on society and on on um, knowledge and the way people think um, about uh, power and about you know truth and everything else is, was enormous. And uh, um, so that's another thing that's happened uh, that 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 I think is a really encouraging. Um, um, uh, sort of precursor, and 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 of course the way that that the impact that that's had on 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 academia and on society and on post discussions about postcoloniality and everything else has been uh, absolutely gigantic. So, um, okay, I don't know who was next, there, but I see three questions over here. Okay. <laughs> The thing is, though, don't don't assume that that you're looking at it. <clears throat> There's there isn't like an end game. There is no sort of like end result. It's that you know, as as technology as technology and education. I mean, you could define all of the three aspects. Technology, education, and pedagogy are sites of struggle and of contestation, and and because they're all really important and central to our society. And so, what's going to happen is is that those three sites are going to be continuously contested, and and uh, and and ground is it's going to be possible to gain or lose ground in those areas. And and so, the question is, how does that you know? How, how is it possible to gain ground? How is it possible, like, not to be like, like, co-opted and in in like to actually serve a negative purpose rather than just compromise? And uh, and and so, and how is the struggle going to continue? So, so I mean, we're do, we're involved in something that has been happening since the <clears throat> since the 18th century at least, and uh, and and we're, th this is not going to there isn't going to be a conclusion, um, you know, <laughs> at all. So that where where you know like once you know one side one side it'll if 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 something is defeated it'll just morph into something else. But, but does that mean that really it's status quo? If 
No. No, I'm, I'm, I'm saying that, I'm saying that, I'm saying that there is, that, that there, that there's always been something that's not in status quo and that's been in, 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 that's contesting and constantly calling into question that which is the status quo. And that uh, if we're able to use uh, new ways of understanding, defining copyright and new ways of we're using technology to gain ground, then that's fantastic. And that's what we should do. But, but there is not, there, we shouldn't look at it in terms of like an end, an end scenario. Because I, th I think that I mean that 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 actually has sort of dangers in it because uh, because then then you end up kind of thinking of, you know I mean politically what's happened in the past right as people say well you know people have said we we need to abandon utopia because utopia is that's the name that's the word that's been used to do all kinds of things that are that have been terrible in the present to achieve something in the future right and we need to be much more present focused. Than, um, than, than sort of utopian and end, uh, you know, scenarios allow us, would, would, would encourage us to be or allow us to be or tend, tend to make us. So I want to go to the other question now or the other two questions if I can. Yeah. And to not get so hung up on who has the right language that defines X or Y or Z. Right. I think that language is very imprecise in our in our quest to be more precise and our finger exactly what it, what it is. It takes our attention away to what is more important, and that's doing and experimenting and reflecting on how is this changing my ability to change or do something better, or connect with other people. So language, maybe not so important, focus on action, learning, doing, reflecting, action, learning, doing, reflecting. Uh -huh, uh -huh. Thanks. That, 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 I think that's a that's a really useful comment. I, I think that, what, what kind of language were, were you thinking of that's problematic? Huh? What kind of language were you thinking of? I, well, every, I mean, Take an educational institution. All the departments are have their own language, mm -hmm. their own set of terminology. And yeah. I mean, they're siloed, but they're not just siloed because they're siloed. They're siloed because they completely they speak completely different languages mm -hmm. than each other. And so, so that's one example. Another example: Open Ed. Is it the Holy Grail? Open Educational Resources. Is it the Holy Grail? Well, maybe for now, but maybe not. And there are other, you know, there are many oh, ways to okay. get to the place that you need to, there are many ways of describing it, and there are many voices and many languages that actually are not represented here for any number of reasons. You know, yeah. Access, they can't get here, they yeah. don't know it exists. So I'm just, just pointing out that language can be uh, a very limiting factor, and yet I think we're communicating, but we may be kind of quite limited. Yeah. No, I think those are those are really useful uh, observations, and I think specialized language is sort of what you're talking about. And, and yeah. I'm sorry that I'm going to have to draw this yeah. to a close because I'm running out of time. But I just wanted to thank you so much for sharing with us and sure. all of you for your comments and, and for continuing the conversation. This sounds really important. So thank thanks. You. Thanks. Yeah.